Being involved in the helicopter rescue of the crews of two yachts in a Stormforce Channel 11 was not exactly the high point of my circumnavigation, uh, particularly when the Coast Guard, in the middle of the night, was unable to help or advise. I'd wintered in New Zealand and sailed across the Tasman Sea to Sydney Harbour, which was one of the real high points of my voyage. Port Jackson, Sydney Harbour, is much, much bigger than I ever imagined and highly populated and busy. And Bondi Beach is much smaller than I imagined uh, from all the pictures and films and TV shows I've seen about it. What I'd not anticipated was how much it could rain in Sydney and how cold the climate could be. So I decided to head north up to Brisbane where the weather was sure to be better. A passage of around 600 miles with good winds from astern. I discovered that the Australian Coast Guard required me to check in as I sailed north along the coast. So dutifully, night and day, I got on the radio and called the Coast Guard and reported my position and route and they would courteously record it and tell me when to report again. It was all pretty efficient and I assumed that it had some safety advantages. Little did I know that unlike the UK Coast Guard, the Australian version is staffed entirely by volunteers and they're frequently retired people who are uh, maybe not all that on the ball. So I got past Brisbane and decided to anchor in the lagoon of a coral island called Lady Musgraves Island. Having spent all the previous year anchoring in similar lagoons in the South Pacific it felt like a, a great place to chill out before heading north again for the Great Barrier Reef. At dawn I motored through the narrow channel um, in the coral, between the coral reefs, into the lagoon, turned south and headed for almost a couple of miles to find an anchorage um, in about three or four meters close, uh, close to the beach of the island. There were three other boats in the anchorage, all very close to the island in the calm waters of the lagoon. I inflated the dinghy and I went ashore. Another island paradise. I mean, not vastly different from the ones in the South Pacific. Wandering round, I, I encountered another Brit off a boat called Colin, who was with his teenage son, and they were heading for Borneo in the steel boat Varney. I was in my GRP Moody 36 called Bambola, and we chatted briefly, and then we wandered off in different directions to explore. I headed back to Bambola after a while as I was tired from the four day passage and lay down to have a snooze leaving channel 16 switched on. Lucky me. All stations switched to channel 80 for important weather information. Got out of my bunk, switched to channel 80 to be told that a northeasterly storm force 10 with winds gusting to 70 knots was imminent. Let me assure you, nothing wakes you up quite so quickly and brightly as that sort of news. I was anchored very close to a lee shore with razor sharp coral all around, and whilst it was a flat calm at the moment, and probably the coral reefs would give me some protection from the waves, 70 knot winds are certainly not to be fooled with. Clearly I needed to get Bambola away from the reef and the beach and find a place in the middle to north of the lagoon and lay out a load of chain. So I up anchored and headed out into the centre of the lagoon to find a safer anchorage to ride out the storm. Another boat had taken prime position so I'd headed up close to where he was and laid out every single bit of my 50 metres of chain and then attached a stronger than usual snubber. Then nothing. Absolutely beautiful day. And I noticed the other two boats, Varney owned by Colin, and a big westerly catch were still anchored close to the island and I wondered if I'd overreacted. As dark fell the winds came up and the waves started breaking over the coral reef to the north of me. The previously placid lagoon began to fill with small breakers with the wind shrieking through my rigging. I checked the GPS and we were still in the same position and feeling the snubber up on the bows the anchor seemed to be dug in and holding. These lagoons have pretty shallow bottoms and they are good holding.
back to uh, back to bed was not really an option so I curled up in the cockpit as the storm increased to its full value gusting around 70 knots and the waves in the lagoon began to be more significant I checked the anchor frequently but it seemed to be holding a bit later a torchlight illuminated the cockpit and I stood up to see Varney close by with Colin in the cockpit and he shouted I've lost both my anchors can I tie on to you frankly uh, I was horrified yes I mean Bambola was holding fine a CQR and 50 meters of chain but I wasn't sure what would happen if I more than doubled the load with the weight and windage of a big steel boat equally I couldn't let a fellow sailor lose his boat because I refused to help so I made what I think now was probably the wrong decision but what I call shouted back was okay Colin um, pass me your line I'll tie you to my stern it was a compromise I wanted to take his line I wanted to take his line to me so that if we did start to drag at worst I could cast him off <laughs> yeah a bit hard-nosed I guess but that was my thinking Bamberg is a center cockpit boat with a small aft deck behind the cabin roof so I went out there and in the darkness and gusting wind Colin maneuvered up to my stern with his engine spluttering flung his line to me from only a couple of meters away which I grabbed and made fast to a stern cleat his engine which had been misfiring promptly stopped Alan, uh, Colin, threw the, uh, Colin threw the remains of the line into the water and headed back to the cockpit then the line stretched down into the water went taut and looking down I could see it had wrapped around a bommie uh, a coral head which was a couple of meters astern of me I tugged but it was firmly fixed in the coral so I shouted to Colin and he came back to the bows and pulled on his end of the line with without being overly dramatic the wind was gusting around 70 knots at the time and both boats were hanging on my anchor with the stern line with the stern line this line to his boat caught in the bommie and we were weaving about Colin pulled up his end of the line and suddenly it came loose and the frayed end came up out of the water the coral head had cut through the line he headed back to the cockpit and tried to start the motor to uh, motor up to me again but the motor refused to start and Varney just drifted away in the semi-darkness towards the coral reef about half a mile astern Colin kept trying to restart his engine but after a few minutes I saw the boat shudder to a stop and start to list over as the keel dragged onto the reef I had pretty mixed feelings at the moment a sense of guilty relief that the line had snagged around the bombing and broken I'm ashamed to say I'm not at all sure my anchor would have held two boats in those conditions and it went against every instinct I had to put the strain of two boats on my anchor and uh, chain in a forced 10 conditions but equally I, I couldn't refuse and I hadn't refused while Colin and his son Invani were on the reef that was perhaps 50 meters wide 30 meters wide something like that they were probably okay but if they dragged across the reef and into deep water beyond then Varney would probably sink so I got into the VHF and called the Australian Coast Guard on 16 couldn't raise them I got on their working channel uh, couldn't raise them and then I got on the signal eventually I got them and what seemed to be an enormous amount of time a voice acknowledged my call and I explained the problem saying I thought there was a real danger to the lives of Colin and his son the Australian Coast Guard came back and to my astonishment said there was nothing they could do to help but there must be something I said you might you must have lifeboats or helicopters no we have no lifeboats available but you could telephone a helicopter if you want <coughs> excuse me but but I don't have a telephone I'm a Brit I only have radios on the boat oh dear said the Coast Guard well let me give you the telephone number of the emergency helicopter and maybe you can find someone to make the call the telephone call for you he then proceeded to read out the telephone number but I said you're the you're the Coast Guard can't you uh, can't you telephone them uh, the, 
from the office. I mean, you must have a telephone. This is a life-threatening situation. No, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Um, you've got to make the call. I'm busy now. There was a click. And despite my repeated calls on the radio, he just didn't come back. Bambola, we have a tele... I can't do Australian accents, but anyway. Bambola, we have a telephone call and we'll call the heli... We have a telephone and we'll call the helicopter. The voice was on Channel 16, and I think it was from the other yacht out in the lagoon. Hey, thank you, I said. And a few minutes later, the voice came back to say that a helicopter was on its way. I went back on deck to look at Varney, who was now well onto the reef with the occasional wave breaking over her. The other boat that had stayed close to the island, the, the big westerly, started to drag or lost its anchor, and it too ended up on the reef, not that far from, Bar from Varney. It was a big westerly catch with um, three or four crew on board, I think. As dawn came up, I saw a small helicopter coming in from the direction of the mainland. I'd been expecting something like a Wessex or a Sea King, but this was much, much smaller. But it had its door open and a diver sitting in the doorway, and it called Varney on VHF, telling them to put on life jackets and shoes and be ready to go into the water. It came in beside Varney, quite low, and instructed the first person to get down towards the water, and Colin sent his son down the stern leather. And the rescue diver, jumped from the helicopter onto the coral and made his way to the stern and having attached Colin's son to his line the helicopter ascended and lifted them both out of the water and flew them towards the island and deposited the young man on the beach. The westerly was now bouncing fairly fast over the coral and the crew were on deck waving, uh, waving to the helicopter. The helicopter then flew back to Varney with the rescue diver hanging on the end of the line. And hovered as Colin climbed down into the water and walked across the coral to the diver. who then signalled the pilot to transfer them to the beach where they dropped off Colin. Having deposited Colin on the beach, the helicopter then made the uh, trips to the big westerly, lifting off the crew and depositing them on the beach as well. The big metal structure you can see is a platform at the edge of the reef, um, a little way from the beach, um, used by passenger boats to bring tourists to the island and it makes them possible to moor up without having to anchor. Apparently it has four steel girders dug into the coral. So having de deposited the last of the westerly crew on the beach, the pilot called me on 16 and said he was heading back to Gladstone and he was low on fuel. At that point, he reported the wind was now blowing only a steady 60 knots, uh, which confirmed the reading on my wind system. Apparently, a surface craft would come out and pick up the crews from the beach when the weather eased. I went to the bows of Bambola to check the anchor and found that the extra strong snubber had broken. The chain was pretty well a taut bar, but with my hand on it, I could feel no indication the anchor was dragging. During the day, the winds eased off more, and that night I slept well and decided to stay there for another 24 hours, as there were still considerable waves in the narrow passage um, between the edges of the coral reef uh, out to open sea. And I was just looking for a really gentle 50-mile sail to Gladstone, the nearest port. I 
didn't want any more stress. When I left, I could see that the westerly ketch had pounded across the coral reef and was now wrecked on the southern shore of the island, but there was no sign of Varney, which I assume had bounced across the reef and sunk in the deep water on the other side. After the 50 mile sail to Gladstone entrance channel, um, it was quite a distance uh, up the Mark passageway, a quite narrow Mark passageway, where I was really pleased to moor up, relax in the marina and get a good night's sleep without having to worry about anchors dragging or failing. The next day I went to find the Australian Coast Guard office because I, I wanted to express my opinion that when there was an emergency uh, reported, telling people to get on with it was perhaps not the uh, best practice. It was then um, I met a more senior member of the service um, who apologised for what had gone on and explained to me that it was a totally amateur volunteer organisation and not a professional service as it was as it is in the UK or France. Everyone was a volunteer and as such couldn't be fired. The gentleman who was on duty that night was simply out of his depth, um, as it were. Anyway, I started walking back to Bamberda and I met up with Colin, who in the marina, who told me that he had put his son on a flight back to the UK. But the good news was that Varney had been reported washed up on a beach on the island beside Gladstone. And he asked me if I could take him round to the uh, island beach to see if she could be salvaged. Apparently, Varney had bounced over the coral reef into deep water and then been pushed by the wind some 60 miles to end up on this um, beach of an island called Curtis Island, which uh, is beside, uh, it's beside Gladstone Town. The next morning we slipped out of Gladstone Marina, down the Mark Channel and headed for the open beach where, to Colin's joy, we could see Varney lying on her side. On the, on the sandy beach, halfway up. I was nervous about anchoring and leaving, and leaving uh, Bambola unattended, so I inflated the dinghy and waited whilst uh, Colin rowed ashore and looked at the remains of his boat. As you can see from the smile on his face as he rowed back to Bambola, steel boats may be slow, but they're really, really tough. He reported he'd got some deep scratches in the hull from the coral, but that the hull was sound, although the rudder was bent and damaged. The really bad news was that the boat had been ransacked. The canoe he used as a tender had been gone, as well as all his radio equipment. But most importantly, his entire supply of hypodermic needles for his insulin were missing. I'm a diabetic, he explained, and he rolled up his sleeve and showed me a tattoo on his arm which said um, I'm a diabetic if you find me unconscious then I need an injection of insulin or said something like that anyway uh, he came back on board we uh, sailed we got the dinghy back on board we sailed round to Gladstone where Colin went off and went in search of help to get Varney off the beach at the next high water whilst he was away an Australian federal police officer arrived beside Bambola, asked to come on board and began a very inquisitive and serious interview about who I was, what I was doing and where I was heading. I mean he was not he was not at all pleasant with it. I told him I'd just got back from taking Colin to see Varney wrecked on the beach and that someone had robbed the boat of all its valuables. He said, uh, well there's a small village, there are houses on the island. Good people, he said. Oh really, I thought. Colin arrived back and came on board and reported that the local yacht club were going to organise suitable boats to pull Varney off the beach at the next spring tide, at uh, high water on the next spring tide, which was in a week or so. The federal policeman then let into Colin in a pretty intensive way and asked him where he was heading. Borneo, said Colin. Why are you going to Borneo? And then it dawned on me what the problem was. Roll up your sleeve, Colin, I said, show him your tattoo. The people who had ransacked Varney had found all the hypodermic needles that Colin used for his insulin, assumed he was a drug dealer or similar, and reported it to the police. Well, that was my guess. The federal police 
clearly thought we were drug dealers or smugglers or something. Strangely, the police guy uh, didn't have a eureka moment when he read the tattoo on uh, Colin's arm telling him that he was, uh, um, he was a diabetic. And he continued questioning but um, for some time and then eventually went away. I left Gladstone a few days later and headed up to Cairns. Uh, but I heard from Colin that they'd got Va Varney off the beach and towed her into Gladstone where she was being fixed. I had nothing, he had nothing to pay for all this and uh, Gladstone Yacht Club had organised the entire thing with volunteers which shows Australian volunteers are actually really good people. All the stuff that had been taken off Varney including the canoe and the syringes had been put back on board and the club arranged for temporary accommodation support for Colin whilst he got Varney ready to sail away again. We lost touch, but I, I think Colin got to Borneo and I got to Darwin via Cairns and the Great Barrier Reef in the footsteps of Cook and Martin Flinders. That's it really. I hope this has been a bit interesting, but if uh, if it has, then uh, you know I'd be grateful if you press the subscribe button and the like button. But yeah, if you don't, it doesn't really matter. I've enjoyed telling this story. I, I've enjoyed shooting the breeze. Farewell, fair winds, safe landfalls. Bye.